The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and dwelt in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, that, was spoke, that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali toward the sea, Across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those who sat in the region and in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other, other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And immediately they left the boat, and their father, and followed him. And he went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every infirmity among the people. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and heavenly Father, we do thank you for the healing that comes uh, only from your son. We can think of so many physical ways that uh, we desire your healing, and none of those are wrong for us to seek you for. But there is one needful thing, and that sin that binds us to death, the sin that we have confessed, and your son uh, that you have sent to die for our sin. We pray that you would bless us now in hearing your word, in hearing about the light of your son that has shined so brilliantly in the darkness. We pray now that you would send him through your spirit to our hearts. Help us not just to know your word, not just to have more knowledge of it, but through your spirit, give us strength to do your will in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So I'd like to throw uh, maybe two famous scientific names out there, uh, maybe not familiar to you or to me, but uh, if you know who these, either, I'll give you even a little bit more. If you know who either of these two people are, I'll give you all the pastor points I got from now until the day God takes me. That's how many pastor points I'll give you. Anybody know the name of Josie Loris? Nope, not familiar to anybody. Uh, how about Anton Senny? Nope, doesn't sound familiar. Well, they're cave explorers. Uh, it, that's who they are. They are famous in the scientific world uh, for a study that they partook in back in, of all years, 1965. Uh, they were cave explorers, and for uh, experimental purposes, they agreed to let scientists send them into two separate caves, totally devoid of light, uh, and from uh, uh, isolation from, from everybody uh, for as long as they could take. Uh, and they had limited uh, uh, communication uh, through earpieces with people at the home base. But the, uh, uh, the one person, uh, Josie, was uh, in the cave for 88 days. 88 days. Oh, it gets better. Uh, uh, okay, so Antone comes out, uh, and he was in there 126 days. Uh, and was provided food and, and all the basic sustenance things, but no light and no interaction with anybody else. So I wanted to talk a little bit. Uh, uh, there's one word that really seems to come out to me in all of the lessons today, and that is this concept of light in the gospel. Uh, in the Old Testament reading, uh, in the psalm, uh, uh, we could even probably pull it out of the, the epistle lesson, but at least in those three other lessons, we have the mention of light somewhere. So we might just uh, realize that the concept of Jesus as the light of the world uh, is important to us. 
that actually uh, we actually need light to survive. We need light to function. Uh, so one of the effects of light deprivation, uh, as the two cave explorers came out, one of the effects was uh, they were in there you know, almost three months, one and one almost five months. Uh, so they were in there. Do you know when they came out um, what their concept of time was? They were at least, both of them, one to two months off in what they thought the actual date was based on when they went in. Do you know why? What is, what is the one activity that we all do uh, in the dark? Sleep. Sleep. Yes, that is the one thing. So what is the natural tendency away from light is, is to sleep. So what they noticed, what the scientists noticed, was that the sleep patterns for these people were so off being deprived from light that they could sleep anywhere. I mean, anybody want to take a nap? Uh, and hopefully not at this point in the sermon, okay, okay. got to watch what you ask up here, you just might get an it. But uh, deprived of light, people can sleep upwards of 30 to 48 hours at a time. And when they wake up, you know what it seems like to them? A nap. So can you see, deprived of light, how it warps us of our sense of time. We need that light. There are rhythms in our brain. There are uh, uh, hormones that are released, parts of our brain that need light to be stimulated to know day from night, uh, to know uh, and orient ourselves to time. We need light. It's not just a physical thing, but it's a biblical thing. And the one thing, the other thing that the darkness does is it isolates us. It separates us from the light, and in a biblical, theological, and very real sense, spiritually, that is not good for us either. We see that in the example of the Israelites today in the Old Testament lesson. Uh, the king at the time when Isaiah was writing uh, this particular uh, text of scripture was Ahaz. And there was this threat of the Assyrians. Uh, they were coming back into the power, and, and they are threatening Israel. And God comes to them, God comes to Ahab, uh, and says, have no fear. I'm going to take care of these guys. You're going to be okay because I am with you. And Ahaz says, hey, God, you know, that's a really good thing. I like that. Uh, but just in case, I'm going to go make alliances with this country, that country. You know, just in case your plan doesn't pan out. Um, not a good idea to second guess God like that. Uh, it is almost like uh, we come to church on Sunday, we hear the word, we know his plan, that he has plans for good for us, that he has a plan for our life, that he is in control, providing all that we need, yet going into the world and living as if that were not the case. Not trusting, uh, not turning to his word outside of here on a Sunday morning. That's the, that's, the, that's the issue that Israel was having at that time. They ch Ahaz chose to ignore God, chose to isolate him and his people from God. And we know from the Garden of Eden that it is not good for man to be alone. So separated from God in the darkness, not a good thing. The funny thing about what the, the cave dwellers did, uh, when, when they were isolated for that long, not just from light, but from other people as well, um, if it's not good for the man to be alone, if God didn't design us that way, what do you think they sought out? Made me look for a pet. I mean, there are some pretty big rats in some caves, I'm just telling you. But do you know that that's what they did? They sought out rats to have as pets. And the one guy, uh, he's in there, and he, he, he finds, he's, he's setting a little trap for this rat, and, and, he, and he gets so downtrodden because as he's trying to ca catch the rat, uh, his one companion there, he kills the rat. Ah! Ah! So desperate. Anybody see Castaway? Wilson! The volleyball that Tom Hanks makes into his best friend, which is not good for us to be divided, it is not good for us to be in the dark, it is not good for us to be separated from God nor from one another. Yet that is expressly exactly what the darkness does. Now we know it was just, you know, well, you know and I know it wasn't just the people Israel back then, but that is us now. We are uh, born in our baptismal liturgy. We are born children of a fallen humanity. But yet we are reborn in our baptisms, children of God. So as we 
leave here, as we leave the light of this world, word and we go into the world, we know we're going to go into a world that is dark. That if that light does not go with us, if we do not, as the psalm says, uh, seek me, says God. Seek out my light. I'm, like, I'm here to give it. Seek it out. I will be here for you. I will be with you if you seek me out. I'm going to be so close to you. I'm not just going to be with you. I'm going to be in you by my spirit. I'm going to be your light. But if we leave that behind here and think it's just for Sunday, we go back into the darkness and it starts to play with our minds. You know how crazy you get in the dark? You wonder why in prison it is a punishment to go into solitary confinement in the dark. Is there any reason, if you are a prisoner of war, how will they torture you? They will put you in the dark. People go crazy without the light. Yet that is what we try to do. Uh, back home in Ohio, I live in, you know, in backwoods Ohio somewhere, up on some hill. Shelly's been there with me a couple times. Uh, there's a sign going down this big hill that I live on. Uh, it says uh, simply this. It says, seven days without prayer makes one week. W-E-A-K. Without that light, without that word in our lives, uh, we go spiritually crazy. We might just think that being friendly with the world is going to fulfill us in the way that the word can. We might seek, like the rats, like the volleyball, we might seek out companionship in the world that is unconnected to God. We might try to be friendly with that, thinking that it can fill us up. But we see from James in the word that friendly with, friendliness with the world is enmity toward God, that we can separate ourselves in the world thinking that we do not need this connection to the light of the world. And just to be very clear, that light is Jesus. That light, that, that word made flesh, it gives us a sense of time. He gives us a sense of purpose. He is our purpose. He, it is he who awakens us. When we see that light coming through the blinds in the morning, it's there for a reason. It is to wake us from sleep. And that light that is Jesus gives us fellowship with God, restores the fellowship with God that our sin separates us from. And so uh, I just want to talk a little bit about what that light does. That light we can see in the gospel lesson is related to repentance. That repentance is related to a calling. That calling is related to a following. And that following is related, uh, uh, connected to God in all areas of our life. So the light that is Jesus, uh, it calls us, he calls us to repentance. I mean, doesn't that seem odd? Does, does Jesus sound like a broken record? I mean, really. I mean, didn't we just have John the Baptist? And what was his message? Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is near. The exact same message of John the Baptist. Jesus says, you need to have a change of mind. You need a change of direction. And that change of direction will come through the work of God in Christ. So that repentance calls us, uh, very much like Jesus called the disciples, it calls us from a occupation, occupation, Occupy to occupy to goes from something that just fills the time, something that just pays the bills. It calls us as disciples of Christ, calls us from an occupation and into a vocation. As in a call, vocation as in the calling, the voice, the word that calls us to Jesus Christ. And he is the voice that we listen to. He is the good shepherd that will go to the cross for the sheep. It is Jesus, the word of God, made flesh. And so where do we hear that? Where on earth might you, I don't know why you came here today, uh, but uh, did you come here to hear your calling? And I'm not talking about like being back with Jesus in his time. I'm talking about right here, right now. Is Jesus calling, do you hear his voice? And we can all do this. That's okay. You can say, amen, pastor. It, it, okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, you can hear his voice here. He is calling us, and we hear that through the word. And there's a gift and a blessing. Dennis was joking around with me. He knows the pastor buttons to push. As you're, we're in the sacristy. What did, I know it was a joke. What did you jokingly ask, Dennis? Is there anything special? 
Is there any? Oh, dude. Okay. If you ever want the sermon before the sermon, ask, ask one of the pastors that before service. Uh, is there anything more special than after, I don't know, 2017 years, the Spirit of God working to gather his people in the midst of a dark world? And so I want to point to the psalm. Where is it that we hear this word? I turn around, I've got it circled in my notes here. We hear it. Uh, 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 there's one thing the psalmist wants. One thing I ask of the Lord that I will seek after. <laughs> that I may what? Dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Be, gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So here, this is, this is church, guys, <laughs> where the word is preached and the sacraments are distributed, where we hear God's voice, and we don't just hear it in the word or in the proclamation, but we hear it in that you heard what she said to you, right? That this is the body of Christ given for you to do this in remembrance of me, calling us from our sin to the forgiveness that is so abundantly waiting there. We hear that within the blessing of the community of faith. Not a have to, but a get to. We need the light. It is a necessity in our lives, not just physically and even more so spiritually. We need the light. And that light comes where two or three are gathered in his name. There is something special going on today. It is the meeting of the wondrous light of the world that is in you and in me, and that is the body of Christ. It is not we who live, but it is Christ who lives in us. We are baptized into Christ and into his death. But that's not the end. We are then raised to new life as he was raised to new life by the glory of the Father. We now live in newness of life. And that calls us to a vocation. That is something connected to God. I had the blessing of uh, uh, doing my second premarital session with a couple yesterday. And, and we're talking about, you know, what does this connection to God mean in a marriage? And, and I would have been remiss if I stopped right there. Um, that connection to God is not just for the marriage. So I, just to test them out a little bit, they're not members of our church, but I, I just you know, I quizzed them a little bit, and I might quiz you. You know, from uh, from our point of view, is there any such thing as the division between sacred and secular? Is there any division? Is there any in, in parentheses? Is there anything that we believe that we profess that is not connected to God? Nada. All things were made through him, and nothing that was made was made without him, John says. So uh, in this uh, reality of the calling that we have from Christ, um, we understand that everything is connected to God. I go from being a simple physical therapist. Oh, I had it made in the world. I was just ready. I, I, the prayer was answered. He got me into PT school. I got a license on a second try. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm in the world. I'm working. I'm making a great living. And he's just up there laughing at me. Hey, you think this is it? <laughs> no. There is a calling on your life. All our lives. There is a calling not just to come to the lake shore, but to, to come to Christ. And the lake shore is what he has provided. So as I reflected with the couple, uh, God is giving you this gift of marriage, or is going to give you this gift of marriage. Where else does that apply? The question is, where doesn't it apply? It applies everywhere. That calling that we have, a pass of physical therapist to a pastor, fishermen that now become fishers from me, of men, fallen children of a fallen humanity now turned into children of God. The difference is that all things are connected to God. All of life is sacred. So now, I mean, I'm just going to uh, uh, make a list here of things that I can identify of people that I, that I teach in Bible study. Now, husbands, housewives, Sons, daughters, 
workers in the world, go into the grocery store, the mechanic, the carpenter, the engineer, the nurse, the IT person, the banker, the physical therapist, the shut-in, the one who can't get out, are now disciples of Jesus and called to his glory, called to his ministry, called to be a light to the nations. And that, my friends, is a powerful calling. So I really hope someone has it in the bubble above their head right now. Uh, just how powerful is it, Pastor? You know, because you know, we may know people, um, uh, ourselves included, that just, anybody feel not real powerful sometimes? <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, we are challenged. So I was out uh, doing nursing home devotions uh, about a month ago, uh, and I'm uh, down at Bartram Springs, and and I'm in there, do worship, we have communion, and uh, one lady who I I know is Lutheran is not there, and so I go to visit her in her room. And here's uh, Angie Dick. (laughs) As shut in as shut in can be, Angie's memory is not what it used to be. I hear the same stories, I get to hear the same stories over and over again. She sees me, and I I come to her, and I have the church bulletin in my hand, and I start talking to her, and and she tells me she's Lutheran again, so happy to see a Lutheran pastor. And she just stops talking to me, and she pulls out her purse. And she digs through her change purse and puts in my hand 78 cents. What would you do with it? Is that powerful? Is that a witness? But it gets better. You want to know how powerful the calling from God is? It is this powerful. That I took the 78 cents as a cherished and tri- It's the widow's might is what it is. She says, I'm sorry I can't do more. And I just looked at it. We just have fun with pastors sometimes. We really do. Um, I, I, I look at her and I say, Angie, I want to ask you to do a little bit more. You should have seen her countenance fall as she starts scraping the bottom. But I just said, Angie, no, 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 Angie, (laughs) don't look in your purse. I want you to look at the bulletin. And I want you, if you would, pray for each of these ministries. Pray for the school. Pray for the teachers. Pray for the pastors. Pray for the congregation. Pray for the work in Peru. Pray for those who are on the the sick. Pray for the military that are listed there. Pray for any one of those ministries that are there. And then you should have seen her countenance. Oh, pastor, I can do that. Power from on high. I'll take those prayers any day. Because it's a calling from God. It's not we that provide the power for it. But it is the very son of God. His word made flesh. It is that word of God. That when we breathe our last. That when we are at our most helpless. That when we are uh, overcome by the darkness. It is the hand of Christ. That nail pierced hand of Christ. That was called to earth. And he came. That holds us when we breathe our last. When our loved ones breathe their last. There is the hope in the midst of the darkness. And that's a calling to follow. Come to follow Jesus. More than just telling people about Jesus, but living with them. Living with them in the midst of the troubles. In the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. They will know God's presence because of our ministry. Our walking with them in the world. There's just one other thing I want to mention. There is one other thing that Jesus does that puts him above John the Baptist. And it's right there in the last sentence of the gospel. It's an open book test. That what are the three things that Jesus did? Two of them John did. One of them was left to Jesus. And he went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and... Healing every disease and every infirmity among the people. Why do you think Matthew mentions two things that seem to be related to sickness? Uh, the disease that he, he, he points to, the healing that it is physical. 
But the second word, infirmity in the Greek, has more to do with um, he healed weakness. Weakness is a symptom. Weakness is a symptom of a deeper problem. Anybody know what the number one symptom of heart disease is? Weakness, fatigue. It's a symptom of a greater heart problem. But it's more than just that physical problem. The weakness that we have is that we die. That's, I hate to say it, but that's the, death is the symptom. If that's the symptom, I can look at the nurse practitioner and she can tell me the, the disease is sin. That lies in the heart. Jesus doesn't just come to cure the symptom. He comes to cure the disease. In the remembrance of that little Easter that we just had, we remember that it wasn't Jesus that was left in the grave. It was death. <laughs> he came to die for the sin of the world. He came to, uh, uh, to hold us, to care for us, to call us home as we uh, breathe our last breath. Um, it is really the completion of our baptism. And it is then, not that we are not just baptized into Christ's death, but in that baptism, we remember that we have the resurrection. We have the one who is the way and the truth and the life. He calls us to repentance. He calls us to follow him. He calls us into vocation with power. So I pray blessings on us all this day. Not just here, but you're going to go home. You're going to go to work. You're going, to go, you're going to go to Publix, Winn-Dixie, I don't care where you go shopping at. You are on a mission trip, and you have got a, we have got a calling from God. Empowered by him as the light shines on us, in us, and from us. I pray the power of that calling for you and for me in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God.